Welcome back, Day Camp friends, to the Day Camp Podcast. I'm Andy Pritikin, the director of Liberty Lake in the Philly suburbs of New Jersey. I'm Sam Thompson from Crystal Lake, Illinois, northwest of Chicago. And I'm Aaron Glucksing from Camp Robin Hood, located just outside of Toronto, Canada. And we are day camp professionals joining forces to provide a forum for summer camp pros like you to share ideas and best practices across North America and beyond. And for today's podcast, we are joined by Ruby Compton and Gabrielle Rail from the Go Camp Pro Camp Code podcast, a podcast they do along with the great Beth Allison that focuses on camp leadership and pretty much all things staff, communication, training, et cetera. Like the Day Camp podcast, uh, Camp Code is a direct, a direct offshoot of the Travis Allison's original long-running camp podcast, Camp Hacker, in which I've been a guest on along with Gabs. Um, so besides Gabby being one of my favorite podcast bestowers of camp wisdom, she's a camp director at the 99-year-old Camp Waro, I think I said that right, in Quebec, Canada. So I'm handing it off to you, Gabs. Tell us your camp origin story. Oh, thanks, Andy. And you did say Waro right, which is I, 10, uh, 10 points you just <laughs> received. Um, my camp origin story, well, I it's not too exciting in the sense that I, I was born and raised uh, at our summer camp. Uh, my parents met at summer camp, not this camp, at another camp in Ontario. Um, and it was just by chance that their camp unfortunately closed and uh, Jackie found a job at a camp, an all girls camp in the Laurentians. And when my father went to go pick her up, uh, he liked the maintenance guy a lot. And so he stayed for, for a week to help, uh, I think it was sledgehammering down some buildings. and. Uh, he liked this guy and uh, the guy said, why don't you come up next year and maybe you can help me set up camp. So he did. And then uh, I guess a couple of years later, they were married. They had a couple of kids. We were living on camp. And uh, every year my parents told us, don't get comfortable kids. This is only for a year. Um, so now I think for my folks, it's probably about four. I think we're there at their 47th Whoa. season living on site. And uh, it's, it's still, it's home and it's wonderful. And my parents really believed in us as kids, myself and my two brothers to go to other camps. So I had a lot of other experiences at different camps, working at different camps. Uh, they believed in that type of experience. And I truly, truly fell in love with camps. I did a, a lot of schooling, different things. Um, but the probably the, one of the more important ones that I did was when I was making my decision if I wanted to stay in camping or not. So I did a graphic design uh, program in England. I thought maybe I'd quit camp. My parents also thought I'd quit camp. And what it did was it made me realize how wonderful and how many things we can do with camp. And so I've combined my graphic design skills and camp uh, to create uh, communication. And I think that's what we do at camp. We tell stories. No doubt about it. That is pretty amazing. So uh, also with us is Ruby Compton, one of my favorite camp conference workshop presenters and a staff trainer consultant and the chief exploration officer of Ruby Outdoors, uh, which she can explain to us at the tail end of her camp origin story. Go for it, Ruby. Right on. Uh, yeah, I was the kid who came home after school, dumped the backpack and played outside all the time, uh, but was also the child that uh, cried when I went to people's houses to stay overnight. and but that was interested in camp. And so all those things came together when I was in about second grade, I went on an overnight with my church to a local church camp and had a ball and loved it. And then went back to camp there uh, every year for a week for about seven or eight summers. Um, and then kind of fell off the camp map a little bit until I was in college and looking for a job. And I'd had a friend who'd worked at the large YMCA camp that was a day camp in the area in Nashville. And um, all, all I knew is that every time I called her to hang out, that when she worked there the summer prior, she would just be like, I really just want to sit at home and watch TV. And I thought that was kind of lame, but it seemed like it'd be a fun job anyway. So I applied and had just a blast um, and felt like camp made me a, a, the person I wanted to be. And so I worked at that camp for seven summers that led to working at an outdoor ed job during the school years until I moved up to Western North Carolina, where I ran a camp for four years, um, and then ran another outdoor ed program. And now I run my own company doing consulting and training for camps. So, uh, where I live, there's about 60 camps within a two hour radius. And I essentially work as a freelance camp person where I can bop around and basically do anything that a camp director does or fill in as a bus driver or life 
lifeguard instructor or a raft guide, whatever folks need, I'm, I'm here for them. Um, and I get to see lots of different camps doing lots of different cool stuff. Uh, and it's, it's pretty fantastic. So um, I am grateful to now be able to support all the really hard work that you all do uh, in any way that I can. Well, that's awesome. And, and I thank you so much for sharing a lot of your knowledge with the camp community. Um, so I just got one question before we get into our content for, for Gabby and Ruby, which is like, you guys are, are serious camp insiders. Like you've been involved in camp for a long time, right? Um, and we talk a lot uh, about how to explain camp to people who don't really get it kind of thing. You guys do such a great job. You're so intuitive uh, on how to articulate and empathize with staff who like are new to camp, right? Like in, in all the stuff that you talk about, um, you're always so empathetic to those people, like, like really understanding how they feel. How do you keep that? I mean, Gabby's been involved in a camp in, 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 her, in her family for 47 years. Like, like how, how is it that you're able to do that? Because it really is magical. I'm, I'm going to throw out there, it's all Beth all right. Allison's fault. <laughs> uh, but really, truly, our, our third co-host on our podcast, Beth is one of the most kind of inclusive and aware of how is everyone feeling and is, does everyone have a seat at the table? Um, and I have learned a ton from her about really making sure I'm paying attention to everyone in the room and how they're feeling and that they're comfortable. Um, and for me nowadays, some of what I'm doing too is like working alongside frontline staff. So when I have an hour long car ride with the two other raft guides to the put in, like I hear about what they're frustrated about and I hear about uh, what they like about working in camp, and what their bosses are doing that's totally frustrating them. And so that gives me some insight as well uh, that, you know, they don't always know that I'm turning around and passing on to their bosses. And sometimes I'm not, sometimes I'm coaching them on like, this is how you can talk to your boss about this thing that you're experiencing. Um, so I think it's important to continue those conversations with those folks as well. Gabby, you have anything you want to add to that? <laughs> I agree with, I of course agree, agree with Ruby about Beth. And I think the three of us talking together, um, I, though we all experience the world differently, um, I think our value system is that um, everybody does have something to bring to the table and how do we create that space so that our staff and our campers can help educate us in the best way of leading our organization. I think the other thing that we share is that um, campism is an amazing place to have a positive impact, not on just the lives of campers and staff members, but for them to have a positive impact on other individuals. And so that's the greater mission is, is that camp can have that ripple effect and to bring your staff members and your campers into that conversation is in itself very, very uh, motivating. And when you open those doors to your to your staff members, especially um, just for them to be heard, I feel you know you'll you'll get uh, staff members though they might not be able to stay with you uh, physically for the rest of their lives, um, they will be committed to to this idea and and that we can leave the campsite better than we found it. I think is sort of, is is the main mission and. Um, I'm constantly learning from my staff, but I'm also very humbled <laughs> over and over again when I think I know, and then they quickly teach me that I don't always know. Um, so I am humbled <laughs> often with them, but it, it's definitely opening up those conversations with them and surrounding yourself with people that, that really truly care. And, and also, you know, having the mental framework, like, like the mindset of being a lifelong learner, right? Because I, what I find all the time is that in camping and in any, any job situation, that people get put into administrative roles and they quickly forget what it was like to be on the other side of things, right? And they quickly are like, I know what I'm doing. I'm telling you what to do, as opposed to be constantly getting that, that give and take, which is just so important for being a good leader, right? Um, you know, I, I remember when I was taking my teacher's exam um, that one of the, an, another teacher said to me, oh, it's really easy. Just when you take the exam, think about all of the answers from the perspective of the student, right? And I took that advice and I aced it. And, and because I think that when, again, when people get put into power, like supervisor kind of roles, for whatever reason, they, they lose that aspect. So, yeah, I think that, yeah. uh, go ahead. Just today, I had one of my directors, she was revising a handbook, and she's like, this is great stuff. We should be going through all this at staff training. And I had to bring her back to, 
you can't make them sit for two hours to get through this whole handbook. They're not going to hold on to any of it. And um, she would have been the person not hold, you know, not wanting to do it that way before she was a director. So, um, yeah, keeping the perspective. Yeah, I think I think for uh, you know, on, and uh, something I learned from uh, Howie, who uh, who is the owner of Robin Hood, is that you know he he always likes to uh, you know get to do at least one job at camp that uh, you know people the staff can see uh, him doing like pick, whether it's picking up garbage around camp or helping with the barbecue, uh, flipping those burgers, you know, just to uh, show the staff that uh, we, you know none of us are. Uh, you know, above that, and that we, you know, and we can still relate to the the frontline people. So, uh, so you know, I've, I've taken that uh, that that uh, advice and uh, always done demonstrated that myself as well. Oh, we're great pickers up of garbage as camp professionals. I mean, I go to the mall and I can't stop myself. I'm like, a, I've got a mental problem at this point. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I'm going to throw it to my camp coders. All right, to to start the conversation, we're talking about. We're talking about staff training 2020. We're talking about things that and trends that we've seen um, that have been successful um, in, in the camp world in, in relating to our, our younger staff and, and getting this new, um, this new generation of young people that, that learn through technology and now all of a sudden we're taking away technology and we're in the woods and all that kind of thing. Um, Gab, go for it. Uh for me, whenever I'm thinking about staff training, um, I, we often talk in Camp Code about staff training starts at uh, the application form, um, and then it starts in the interview. What are we What are we trying to get across to our, our our new staff members and our returning staff members? For me, number one is believing in something bigger than yourself, knowing that you have a place where what you're going to contribute is going to have a long term impact. And I think it's especially with what I'm finding with the generation that we're working with today, that's a huge value is that they don't want to waste their time on something that's not going to have a positive impact. And they're also very aware that um, there is no such thing as no impact. So whatever I'm doing is going to have an impact, whether it's positive or negative, and I want to make sure it is positive. But on the other side of the coin, I think a lot of this current generation also feels very hopeless and helpless because they see a lot of the things, including the climate and right now pandemic deteriorating around them, that their families, um, you know, they're not going to have the same livelihood that maybe their parents had. So, so they're, they feel a little bit helpless and they feel a little bit hopeless. And I think as camp directors, we're there to show them the concrete tools and the concrete impact that what we do um, can make a difference. But you want to hire staff members that are at least are starting on that foot that they want to to make that difference and that they're camper focused first and that's what they're excited about so when i'm starting with my staff that is my my main goal and i feel that when you start that way that every staff member whether they get out of their car or their parents car or off the bus and that first foot hits the campgrounds or the parking lot that on that first day i feel that those staff members want to do well. And so it's our responsibility to make that second step that they take something that is caring, warm, welcoming, and inclusive. And I think that, you know, talk to any of your friends that are the most introverted individuals and ask them, what is it about this scene in, you know, the first 30 minutes that would make you panicked and nervous? And I think a lot of camp directors tend to tip a little bit on the extroverted side and so they can come into a room and this is just exciting energy but for people that are introverted or just anxious um, we have to break down down that first entry and look at it as how do we make sure that they feel the most cared for and welcomed and that everything is thought of and when we do that we're role modeling we can use that example and we can role model that for campers on the first day when you're meeting them, when they don't have friends, where they don't know where to sit on the bus. What are we gonna do with that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is fantastic advice. I love that. Uh, just a question about Camp Waro, because I love the fact that your family's been there for so long. So how has your staff training, your traditional orientation kind of stuff, how has that evolved in the last, like, let's say five years? Huge. Um, it evolves all the time, constantly. 
Uh, I can't stop uh, changing what we're doing. Um, Ruby will tell you when we're teaching classes, I'm also evolving my class every time because I, I need to keep, every time I learn something, I have to adapt it. Integrate. Um, but it changes, it, it, well, we have a framework. And I think that what I, what I want to say to this is though, to all camp directors is to be weary, uh, just to be cautious of the pendulum swing. So anything, if there's something that happened the year before, let's just say you, you had a lot of walkouts when it comes to staff members, make sure that the adjustments that you make the next year isn't only to correct and even make the bigger mistake of overcorrecting. So it has changed, our staff training has changed in a huge way over the past five years, but you wouldn't have felt it necessarily from year to year. It's very small shifts that we make so that everybody can adjust to it. Gotcha. Especially with the, uh, you know, the people being so connected to traditions at camp and stuff like that, they don't want to feel like they're in a, a brand new place the next year and not have, uh, you know, not, not have that comfort level that they associate with the traditions. So that gradual change is good, ad good advice, I think. Yeah. So one of the things that Gabby was um, referring to and talking about how, you know, staff training starts at the initial, like filling out the application, right, and the interview and all that kind of thing, is, is that feeling of of including people in the community and how important that is um, in the whole ramp up, right? The whole onboarding now has become so much more important than it ever has been. Um, and, and, you know, being cognizant, like she said, of the introverts and of the people who may be stressed out about, you know, working at camp for the first time, if they've never done it before um, and, and addressing it, addressing it head on and dealing with it, right? Um, Ruby, thoughts? I love Gabs that you started us off the way that you did because um, some of what you said made me think of something that was talked about last week at Tri-State. Um, Priya Parker was the opening keynote and she wrote a book called The Art of Gathering. If you haven't read it yet, neither have I. I'm working my way through it. <laughs> um, but she said something that was like totally just mind blown. It was the moment where I went, oh yeah, there's something I haven't thought about that's of universal truth. And she said, introverts make the best gatherings. They host the best gatherings because they think about all this stuff and they've felt what makes them feel comfortable and what doesn't. And I was like, yep, 100%. Like I, I am the obnoxious extrovert and how I host parties and gatherings. And I have seen great gatherings that have happened that it was totally an introvert, like being the puppet master. So um, I love that. And, and something else that Priya talked about was this idea of purpose and that every gathering needs to have purpose. And so I think that that's particularly important during staff training um, that we talk about purpose and mission and values and, you know, can your staff recite the mission statement? Depending on your mission statement, that may not really matter, uh, especially if you're with a larger organization that has a super wordy one that doesn't apply as closely to camp. Um, but I think there should be one of those things, be it values, be it mission statement, being vision statement, outcomes, at least one of those, your staff should straight up be able to recite um, because they need to understand what we are at camp and what we are not. And that helps with some of the decision making. If you can always go back to, well, what is the point of us being here? Um, then yeah, this decision I'm thinking about, it totally makes sense. Or this decision I'm thinking about, maybe it doesn't fit. It's really, really critical. And, and Gabs and I teach a, a class with Go Camp Pro where we work with uh, camp directors over the course of 12 weeks to help them build their staff trainings. And part of that class is them, you know, outlining their schedule and uh, we get to look at those. And I would say that we spend the first couple of classes talking about how important it is to have some time thinking about, talking about, explaining playing with, you know, considering your mission. Um, and do you do an hour block at the beginning of training? Or are you at the end of every little training block saying, hey, how does this, uh, how does this fulfill our mission? You know, however it is you decide to talk about it, it needs to be talked about at camp. And camp directors will say, we don't have time. And I'm like, it's the most important thing that you're doing. <laughs> you're going to make some time. Uh, we'll talk about editing later. But um, I, I think that Priya was so on point when she talked about so often we gather without purpose. And 
that we need to outline that purpose. Don't assume that everybody's there for the same reason. We need to all get on that path together and talk about it and understand that the purpose to me may feel really different from the purpose to you and why I'm here personally may be different from the why you're here, but that we all have to be kind of on the same boat, um, excited about those specific values. So uh, that's, that's kind of my first and foremost and the thing that I feel like, I think people are getting it, uh, but I, I feel like it's often our starting point is like, you got to start with the mission. You got to start there so that folks know where we're, we're driving this ship. Wise words, wise words. So, so last year, one of the things we spoke about on our, our podcast about staff training was about um, the delivery of, of this information and um, not in just like the different formats of it, but um, as opposed to one size fits all for everybody creating um, staff trainings that were more um, for specific aspects or almost creating like little mini versions of tri-state at your camp to have people choose activities. Um, and we tried that. Uh, it was very successful. And I spoke to many other camps who have come up to me in the last year and told me that they tried it at their camps and were very happy about it. Uh, it seems that common sense, right? You give people some choices, and, um, and they're gonna sort of embrace it because they're a little bit empowered, you know, during this like whatever 20, 30 hours of training that we're forcing down their throats. Um, and and I, I, I think it's important now for uh, camp directors to, to create a balance between, you know, the stuff that's like essential, everybody has to hear, right? And then giving them opportunities to improve themselves in areas that they think they need to get better at also, right? Um, so I'm curious, is that the kind of thing uh, you guys talk about in your little uh, counseling sessions? It's, it has certainly come up as one um, strategy. Um, and one of the, the exercises, Gabs, do you want to talk about your rate your staff exercise? I think that fits really well here. Yeah, so um, one of the exercises that um, I lead is rate your staff uh, one through four. So four means you have very little knowledge about the topic. And three means you understand this topic, maybe shaky in addressing it. Uh, two, um, you can handle this topic very well. And one means you can teach it. And um, this is a, the camp director that rates the staff. And it's, if you have a staff of, let's just say 70, that might be difficult to rate every single staff member in every single category, but you can clump them up into first year staff members, uh, first year, um, but that were in the CIT program, third year staff members, where they should be, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this helps with isolating what staff members can you take and utilize in some of, um, in some of the training. So maybe your ones and twos are gonna help and assist with uh, group discussion, scenarios, uh, journaling, um, uh, you know, uh, leading uh, table discussions, uh, running mini sessions. So you're already isolating those individuals prior to camp. So you have a, an understanding. And um, the other thing that, that I like to do is send out a survey that has over 20 topics. And underneath each topic, there's a description uh, that talks about that specific topic and they rate themselves on where, where they're at. And then I know, and they can also rate interest. Like I want to learn more about this. So this tells me who can assist in certain things and does that cross over with my list? And, um, but I wanna make sure that every single staff member has an opportunity to flex their leadership muscles and also has an opportunity to lift some, somebody up. So your returning staff members are probably returning staff members because they're, they're great. And if they're not great, then I would suggest you reflect on hiring them back because returning staff members that aren't great can do more harm than, than good. So make sure they're, they are great. <laughs> um, but those great staff members get bored really easily. Uh, they're camp people. They need to do and they need a little bit of pressure. So what kind of pressure are we creating for them? Um, and then for our, our, our less experienced staff members, if we are only putting them on the end of learning and receiving, that can be very, very draining. So uh, also creating part of that survey is something that they would like to maybe talk about. Uh, Ruby has a great activity where you, talk, you teach for 60 seconds on a topic and have uh, certain individuals uh, do that. I like giving um, a camera to my, uh, or ask my staff members that are new to the camp to take pictures of certain 
and areas of camp that they find special and present it to returning staff members and they get to see how new staff members see camp through their own eyes etc cetera, etc cetera. so how do you let those people shine but i rate them myself and i get them to rate themselves and then i'm that's when i start it helps me create that large um excel document of multi-layered learning so I tried a new strategy last year, trying to mix those things together and use my staff more. Um, so I assigned, or they got to choose their role, counselor or child, and we did one whole day as a day of camp. And so as we're all in swim lessons, for instance, one of the children would sneak away, somebody would notice it, and we'd start our missing child drill which includes everyone getting into the water in May, freezing. Um, but it was hilarious because, you know, when a peewee camper, who's a regular adult, <laughs> runs off and their fake counselor runs after them as they're running towards the playground, it was, it was very entertaining. Um, and it's front-loaded lots of um, organization and some pre-meetings with all the people who are going to do roles. Um, and I would not do it every year because you know that would become redundant too but it was fun to do now and then that's great um well ruby you gave a session at tri-state about how to integrate your um <clears throat> your veteran staff in more um I'm, I'm guessing that this was some of the stuff we're talking about it totally is and and credit to gabs because a lot of it came from her brain and then we adapted it into a larger session but i, I think one of the models that is particularly interesting and I'll, I'll throw out there as a, a teaser and then if you want to know more you know be in touch with us uh, but is this idea of Clark Kent versus Superman leadership that uh, we live in a world where the superheroes are the ones that get all the credit that you know to be the all-star of your school you're likely the the valedictorian or the team captain or it's that front and center right uh, and that actually leadership, especially as you get higher up, um, middle management and above, there, it's a lot less about being the superhero and a lot more about the, the nudges and the seeing potential and, and getting people to ask questions and, and get themselves there. And, and so that's that kind of like that Clark Kent, like you got the glasses on and you have to nudge other people to, to step up and lead. And, and I told my return staff all the time, like, you guys are responsible for creating the culture that you fell in love with. Like the reason you want to come back was because there are other people who were already here who made this what it's so amazing to be. And I can do some of the legwork, but in the end, like y'all have to do the, the heavy lifting. Uh, and so if you want this to be a place where we can give feedback to each other that's honest, but, but careful, you know, and like full of care, um, then, then you have to do that. I can say that that's something we do, but if you don't do it, then it, it isn't part of our culture. Um, and, and it's, it's the little thing, like this is a little technique that I share all the time that I would tell my return staff that when um the new staff were arriving that first day that to not ask them you know do you know where the dining hall is so you can go see ruby to do your paperwork but instead to ask has anybody shown you where the dining hall is because that puts the responsibility on us because i am a hundred percent that person that'll be like oh yeah i totally know i have no idea but i don't want to tell you <laughs> that. so uh i think it's important that our staff know that that as a returner there are going to be some different moves some different expectations um, and and that the success of the new staff is on their shoulders and and I would straight up tell them if the new staff are not doing well I'm gonna come look at you and say what's going on and and there are outliers to that for sure but in general if you have new staff that are not successful, especially as a category, uh, we need to look and see what kind of us versus them is happening versus us working together to build that person up and Clark Kenting it. So uh, it, it's a fun little model that we played with and it, I think it fits really well and it's easy to grasp. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome. And, um, you know, great, again, great empathy for the new people. And because these poor people, they come into these trainings and they feel like a fire hose is shooting down their mouth of information, you know, like how could they not feel off kilter, you know, about that. But in regards to the Clark Kent thing, I just want to say, um, that's such a great metaphor, first of all, awesome. And um, I went to two great sessions at Tri-State 
um, one by Michael Brandwine and one by Scott Arizala, where the crux of the sessions was all about how to be a great leader by taking a step back and asking questions, right? So it was all about how to get your people to ask questions. So how to get your middle management to ask questions to their staff, how you get the staff to ask questions to the kids. Right. And that's sort of that Clark Kent leadership you're talking about, not and going back to Gabby's thing about the first orientation, not being like Superman trying to raise the energy level and blow the roof off, you know, kind of thing, because that's not how most people jive. Right. That's not how they, the most of them work. Um, I think that's a that's an interesting um, observation. And I think that everybody's in agreement of and I could see more and more people being more cognizant of that in their trainings. Next thing up, I I, um, I, I wanted to. Um, to bring up the idea of the, the online training, right? Um, and, and how that integrates in. Um, and I'm curious, um, Sam and Aaron, if you guys are doing it at all. Um, I, I've been trying to do it uh, not so well the, the last couple of years in that I have a camp parent that works for a community college that does online training. And I'm trying to sort of do it with him, you know, uh, you know so that I own it and I can, I can do it myself, but it's just, it's a huge amount of work. Uh, to get that whole thing going. Um, but it seems like a lot of this compulsory stuff, a lot of this stuff that sort of has to get explained and done does not necessarily have to be done during that precious face-to-face -face time that we have. And it seems like the kind of thing that we should be uh, utilizing. You know, for us, our mandated reporter training, um, each state has their own, or I would assume all states, um, have their own um, place you can go to get that online and get your certificate before you even make it to uh, camp and then bring the certificate with you. So we try to take that piece out of ours and do that online um, as well as defensive driving because my people have to drive in between. You can do that online or if they need boating safety, that kind of thing. Um, we try to get those before they reach us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think for us, you know, there are there are some great uh, online resources and organizations that are providing training, which which is great for s certain organizations. Like for us, we we have uh, experimented with some of those online services, and they're fantastic. Um, and the videos are, are are amazing, and it's very interactive. Um, but for us, uh, you know, we found that just. Um, you know that it, it it ended up being supplement. It ended up being additional uh, materials that, uh, yes, provided great um, you know educational advantages to the staff that actually watched those videos and did those did the uh, exercises. But um, it was uh, it was t it's difficult when you're you know you're not paying these people very much to work for you to sit at home for for you know four hours or you know six hours even an hour to you know do something at home uh before they come to camp um and and have that completed uh in time for the summer um so even when it comes to like the health and safety training that we do um it's it's been uh it's been a challenge to chase people down to get them to sign those papers and saying that they've watched those uh videos or done the online uh, exercises so um so we've gone uh, back the, the past couple of years, gone back to doing like all that stuff, uh, the, the, that those um, administrative things like the health and safety training done it. We've gone back to doing it in person, trying to make it as quick as possible and just get them to sign those papers while they're in the room and just get it over with. Cause our office staff have been burdened with, uh, with that stuff. But I think there's a great place for those, those that, that video content um, for the more, the more engaging stuff um, and, you know, even offering it, um, you know, for us, I think the, the best thing to do uh, if we continue to offer the online stuff would be to offer it as a bonus to the staff who wanted to get, you know, more, uh, you know, more, pieces to put on the resume, for example, or if you know, there could be a cert certificate of completion for doing something extra that they could actually take away with them. I think that that, uh, that approach um, w would probably work the best for, you know, for us moving forward. And we, we may have to consider doing some of that stuff depending on you know, um, how much time we have for training this year, if anything changes due to um, you know, restrictions or whatever that the government's putting on us. So um, I, I, I think there's a, gr a great place for it is just finding a way to make it work for your staff and making it valuable enough for them to do it so that they're not, they don't feel like it's an additional burden that they should be getting paid, um, you know, extra for. Yeah, well, maybe just a really cool hoodie. What do you think about that? <laughs> right. I, Aaron, I'm so glad you brought up that, that piece about 
um, the following up and chasing the paperwork and the, and chasing the follow up and it ends up being this yeah. other thing because that was a hundred percent the experience I had with it as a staff member watching my boss, as I got up into leadership team, like, you know, she's onboarding 200 people. And, uh, in addition to the 15 pieces of paperwork we had to do for this agency camp, like we also had to go make sure they had clicked through all the things. Like it was so much, you know, so ridiculous, but the flip side is, um, so that's where I kind of saw the model of maybe we had required things ahead of time, but we watch a fair number of those videos in training, which that's valuable face to face time, but we might watch a snippet of it or kind of the most valuable stuff and then do some turn and talk about how this applies at our camp. Uh, but she also there um, did get staff accounts for the leadership team. So if you have folks that are stepping up, um, that, you know, know they're going to be taking on more responsibility, I don't think it's an unreasonable ask to say part of stepping up in this leadership role is this additional training ahead of time. Uh, and if you're an accredited camp, there's a really easy way to knock out that like, yep, we did supervisor training and you can print out the list of what you made them do and, and that they signed off on it. And, and there you go. Uh, so, you know, it is a balance. And I think it's important to know that like, it is a little bit of, of some paper chasing. Um, and I have a lot of opinions about digital training. So I'm just going to throw out a few of them <laughs> right now. Um, so uh, I, what, how we were paid there was if you got it all done by staff training, you got like a $50 bonus. Um, and that was motivating enough. Now, I also recognize that was 15 years ago and times are changing and our staff are changing. So that, that may not be good enough, but I do think sometimes an incentive that doesn't have to look like hourly pay, it can look like some sort of training stipend or bonus can be an option to explore. Um, I am currently like this past weekend, I'm working through an onboarding process with a large national outfitter uh, and their experiences in like guiding program. And so I had six hours of online training, six hours. <laughs> and what I will give them major props for is they were short little modules that then they were asking us to turn around and say, okay, this that we just taught you, how are you going to apply that? It wasn't just regurgitate the information. It, it really forced that next step of take this information we just shared with you. And now we're going to give you a scenario, type out how you would deal with it. Um, and it is more labor intensive, but I can guarantee you, I retained a lot more from that training than a training where it's just a sit and get. So consider, are there some little videos you can do? I also would like sneak training in. <laughs> I mean, maybe you're not uh, crushing them with a lot of content, but maybe I'm sending out a video to all my staff prior to their arrival and I'm outlining what our policies and procedures are for while they're on camp. And yeah, I need to review those when they get there, but I don't have to be as specific about saying, but really guys, there's no alcohol on camp because I've already said that in a video. And uh, it, it looked like this fun, interactive way to touch base with them, but it was also like providing a little bit of content for what I need them to know when they step foot on camp. So I think that that's, I think sometimes just thinking about what is the content that we are, are putting to them via video. And then to speak to the point about like, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Get your staff to do it. When you do a great training session, when they're working through scenarios, this year, have them film it. Everybody's got an iPhone or a phone that has video capabilities. So have them video some of that uh, or you know, give you a 30 second, this is what we learned in this session. And then you have some of the content there and you can put that together for future video trainings. And it's not just you sitting in your office talking to the computer which is fine to a degree. I did a lot of that, um, but my, my videos with, maybe I'll send you all a link. You can put it in the show notes. Like I had one where there was a dance break with my desk rabbit. Like <laughs> you gotta put in some gimmicky stuff for people to be excited and interested in it. So, um, yeah. but it, it can be done and you don't have to do it alone. That's good. Um, one of the things that Ruby was touching on was the compliance and Aaron, um, which is such a big deal. I think that we as day camps, um, we have a bit of an advantage over our resident camp friends in that, you know, the, the vast majority of our staff are local, you know, once the college kids come home, which they are now. Um, and one of the things that we uh, implemented a few years ago, uh, shout out to Nate Potts, who was working for me at the time that, that came up with it, is that we put a few employment verification, uh, employment finalization uh, dates in just for like an hour or so. And we put like, 
we gave them like a choice of like three and they would come on a weekend at like three or four in the afternoon and we had and then we made sure their i9s were filled our w4s and and all and their direct deposit which is a big thing i suggest highly to my colleagues out there direct deposit is an awesome thing for camps um and then and then let them ask questions right and then you realize especially the new staff because uh, this is just actually for the new staff that you're telling them all this stuff during the interview process and then you're sending them all these things to click and, and, and do and they really you know didn't remember a lot of stuff so it gave them a good form not during staff orientation with 100 people or whatever to uh to ask questions which was really great um and then you know we even put in a little bit of a tour at that time just to make it a little bit campy um and um, everybody was pretty happy with it i think that was part of that whole onboarding and making them feel like part of the process kind of thing and not just waiting till that first day of orientation to make it all happen um, and so that just brings andy that's just that's just an example of when you are hitting a struggle that a lot of the times when there's a struggle um, I think as camp directors, we just get frustrated and we just wish, why can't my staff just do this? It would just make my life easier if we just did this. <laughs> and, in, and, and in a way that's ignoring it, that's, that's just being frustrated for good reasons and ignoring it. But when you walk towards it, uh, usually what happens within the solution is actually not you uh, eradicating the issue, it's actually a bonus to your organization. So with what you're talking about, is you're bringing people together, you're showing them how to do things, you get to give them a tour, their anxiety is going down because they've, they've met other people. There's all of these wonderful bonuses. So it's not just getting rid of the issue, it's actually there's a positive on the other side. And I think that as camp directors, you know, when, when we feel frustrated, that's our opportunity to, instead of turn, you know, give it the cold shoulder, walk towards it and see what is the possibility on the other side and nine times out of ten it's not just neutralizing it's 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 a bonus yeah and, and you know i have a big uh, button behind my desk that says we've always done it this way with the big ghostbusters thing through it you know and i i think that we do fall prey to that gabby especially some of these camps that have been around for generations um that people go yeah that sucks and that we're you know but we you know it's something we do here kind of thing which is like what um so yeah i i appreciate the uh walk towards it and uh and deal with it kind of thing so so one of the big questions i wanted to ask my camp coders is um so new staff right they're coming to your staff orientation and as my good friend the great professor dave says like these are educated people they're going to figure out where the bathrooms are and, and all that kind of like nuts and boltsy kind of thing and the most important thing is making them feel like they're part of the community right so um so at a day camp where they're not living there for six days in a row prior to your first day of camp they're coming for three hours here and three hours there maybe you get a weekend day if you're lucky and all that kind of thing um some advice for our day camp brethren across the country from our wise women as to as to ways that we can try to get these people assimilated into our camp community and not have it feel so forced and contrived. Um, I, so I'm going to answer this question off the bat because I still remember my very first day working at summer camp as a 19 year old didn't really know what I was getting into. And I am a total sucker for MTV's road rolls real world challenge, <laughs> which is now just the challenge. But I remember that they had, you know, you drive down the big, long, windy road. It's about a mile long. And they had signs all along the way. Some of them had kind of like inside jokes, but there were, there was definitely like, you know, welcome to camp and how much further is it? And don't worry, it's the parking's coming up soon. And, and just kind of like all these little personal things, right? And they had somebody directing traffic, telling you exactly where to park. And then you got out of the car and somebody greeted you and said, hey, I'm so-and-so, just walk up to that sign. And there was somebody there who greeted me. And I just remember walking up like onto the lawn for the first time and like shaking hands with the staff member that was there. And I felt like I was on a TV show. I was like, I'm about to embark on this incredible adventure. And these are all my new friends and I can't wait. And I, I just remember it felt so special. And it really, it was like a series of people that had matching shirts and they shook my hand and introduced themselves. Like that was the extent of it. And then told me where to go next, right? And they just had somebody stationed all along the way through it. So there was never in that first 10 minutes, a, I wonder where I'm supposed to go. 
because they had that mapped out. And then we kind of were put in this holding room, which is where all our training happened. Um, and there were folks floating around and there was, you know, you made your name tag and you find a seat and start looking at these materials. Like they just had very clearly thought through that what is that supposed to feel like and that there wasn't downtime and uh, and yet there was still opportunity like when somebody else was walking behind you and be like this is so crazy what are we doing this summer I can't wait but that feeling of walking up and and seeing those staff and like that the warm handshake the eye contact all the all the things Michael Brandwine teaches about uh, they pulled off really well and and really made me feel a part of it even though then there was stuff that was said and, and, you know, jargon that was used that I was like, I don't know what's going on, but it's okay. That first 10 minutes they nailed. Right. As opposed to hurry up and wait, which is how a lot yeah. of orientations mm -hmm. start. Right. Gab, what are your thoughts? My thoughts is, uh, well, uh, bring, if you have an opportunity, bring your uh, returning staff in early, um, bring them in early, let them get the screams and the jumping up and down if they haven't seen each other in a long time <laughs> out of the way, because that can be intimidating to uh, new staff members and, you know, uh, celebrate last year, say thank you for coming back, talk about the vision and the mission of this year and and say it all starts with our staff it all starts with this team and how do we want to make this team be that team i love using my second year staff members to talk about what what made that difference so for me ruby would be that second year staff member saying when i walked in with those signs and etc cetera, etc cetera, some of the returning staff members might say oh yeah i vaguely remember we did those signs and that was kelly and that was her idea that was such you know, we only did that once, but oh my goodness, maybe we should be doing that again. Um, and all of those little points. So get your returning staff members on board. Know that this is also part of their job, which is what I do in our, in our um, hiring chats as well. I would also emphasize that I know that during sessions, they're going to do a great job. I know that during sessions that they won't, they'll only lift up their hand when nobody lifts up their hand. I know that they will ask questions when it's gonna help move the group forward. I know that blah, blah, blah. I'll say all the things that I know that they're gonna do great. Uh, that's obviously a friendly reminder to, of, to them to do those things great. But I'll emphasize that I've hired them because they, knew, they know how to do those things. Where their job is most important is those walks between point A and point B. I know they're gonna be inclusive. I truly do know they're gonna be inclusive within the session framework when we're doing group discussions or scenarios. Um, et cetera, et cetera. But right when it's break time, um, it is natural that they go towards people that they already know. It's normal. It, it's, it's not cliquey. It's clumping. Clumping right. is it's normal a, human behavior. It's normal human behavior. And we need to be aware of that and, and try to say, okay, though I want to do that, I need to go towards somebody that's new because the walk between A and B is, can be the loneliest walk. The waiting for meals is the loneliest time. Brushing your teeth or uh, waiting for your lift to come and pick you up can be, that's when it tells you if you belong or not. These are the spaces. And using your second year staff to talk about that person that did walk with them from between A and B and how that made them feel. And then of course, link it back to our mission here and how we, we need to teach this to our new staff members so that our they know how to do that for our campers. That's awesome. That's so great, Gab. I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that uh, you know people tend to overlook it and it's, it's such an important, important thing. And I've seen people who didn't come back because of, you know, because of that very, those very examples. So glad you mentioned it. Yeah, well, I think, you know, at a day camp, because we're not, flying everybody out, you know, to be there for that six days in a row at a resident camp. Um, I highly recommend having a new staff orientation, you know, first and foremost, you know, with those people. And you can invite, like I've said, invite the second year people, you know, the specific ones, or as I'm going to talk in my day camp tip of the week, you know, orientation leaders, like some people who are, you know, experienced people, but they're young and, and, and good examples of, and, and still remember what it was like. Uh, when they first got there. And, um, and, and during that uh, new staff orientation, why not teach them one, you know, one of those uh, camp traditions or inside, you know, inside jokes or whatever, so that when they, you know, when they're at the, you know, when they're at the big group setting the next day, they, they fit in. Right. Because as Gabs was saying, 
no matter what, no matter how much you coach them and preach to them, when you have your first all camp, you know, get together, it's going to be a whole hug fest and scream fest and cry fest for so many people that haven't seen each other in, a, you know, in 10 months, you know. All right. So I just got back from uh, Tri-State recently. And um, if anybody has been to Tri-State, they'll notice um, a huge area of the exhibit hall is uh, taken up by this company called CRS, Commercial Recreation. Uh, professionals and uh, and specialists, excuse me, and and they have been involved in camping for as long as I've been in, involved, which is a quarter of a century at this point. Um, and they are the fine purveyors of of things involving water, whether it's the big slides or the uh, water trampolines, and and they're distributors of the Wibbits and all that kind of thing. Um, but they're also huge supporters of ACA, and um, and they're great middlemen, I call them, in that they don't necessarily manufacture that many things. They do manufacture some awesome pull slides, which I've bought. But um, because they've been involved in camp so long, they're a great resource to go to, to tell them about what you're looking for and, and, and ask questions and tell them about your camp setup. And they could come up with some great ideas and customize it for you. And in this world where it's just so easy to go on the internet and find some company in China or whatever um, and, and get a good deal, um, but not necessarily have it fit for your camp. Um, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of supporting those that support the camp industry, right? And in particular ACA. So I don't know if you guys noticed if Ruby, if you were in the exhibit hall and you saw all that rubber stuff in the corners and all that. It was but, epic. Uh, yeah, but Rich and Ron and the CRS crew, they're just super people and their whole little contingency from, uh, I think they're in Montana. I think they're actually uh, located. So anyway, props out to them. So um, thanks so much, Ruby and, um, and Gabby for your wisdom. You, you, I, we could talk to you guys forever, but you're gonna have to go to Camp Code, the awesome podcast on Go Camp Pro. Go to your uh, iTunes or whatever and just look up Camp Code, you should find them. Um, and every single episode has to do with the kind of stuff that we're talking about today and more. Um, it really is super valuable stuff. And like they said, missing from their uh, triumvirate is uh, on this podcast today is Beth Allison, who hopefully is listening to this because we're giving you major props, Beth, because you're awesome too. <coughs> Excuse me. So we are moving on to the day camp tip of the week. Da, 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 da. We need a theme song for the day camp tip of the week. So the first thing I want to talk about is something I was talking to Ruby about at Tri-State, which is something I integrated last year uh, that has a lot to do with one of the last things we were talking about which is uh, orientation leaders. So as opposed to um, our camp orientations, especially the new, new staff orientation being led 100% um, by old people and uh, you know, super experienced veterans, um, we were very intentional about finding some of those second and third and fourth year um, people like, you know, honestly, between the ages of like 19 and 24, who really get what we're doing, and who have a lot of that positive energy and all. And we brought them in for extra training. Um, and and talked about and various team building games and things with them. And, and basically made them the camp counselors during our new staff orientation. So when they came in, we weren't as elaborate as Ruby's description of what happened at her camp, although now she's inspired me to do more. But um, we broke them into groups run by those orientation leaders. Um, we treated it like it was the first day of camp. We did some team building things with them. And as we did activities throughout that day, um, they had a peer or a near peer to talk about camp and, and to talk about it from their experience and people who were in their shoes uh, recently. Um, and in this world of camp where we tend to have like the worker bees and then the admins and not much between and sometimes you lose people because there aren't those middle steps. Um, this orientation leader thing with a really cool t-shirt by the way Aaron, I gotta tell you, that was a big sell on that. Um, it was a great little extra step that you could tell, even though we didn't, we don't have an admin for you, role for you just yet. Here's a thing for you. They really bid on it and they really cherished it. And, and you can see, that, I mean, for the whole season, a lot of these people's chests were puffed out and, uh, and they really, uh, they really loved it. So that is my tip of the week. On to you, Sam. All right, so for once I don't have an art project or a game, I'm actually gonna go with the theme. So um, last year I was looking for an end of uh, my camp training, something to 
pull it all together and try to leave them inspired um, at the end of it. Um, so as they got off the bus at the end of a workshop, I had found um, a the Camp Counselor Manifesto, which I found off of the Summer Camp Professionals Facebook group. I'm always looking for something that speaks to me about what I want to say to them. And so for the first time, I used um, a technique that Ruby and I used um, in Texas, and I, ha I really haven't used it since then, where I cut up the manifesto. And as they got off the bus, I gave each person a line from the manifesto in order in the circle. And so one would start off and say, I'm a summer camp counselor. The next would say, I believe in camp. And then the next would say the next line and so on. And it kept them all involved and they all were quiet for as long as it took to go through the manifesto. And I think um, if you find what speaks to you and then find your way to deliver it and pull it back all together so there's closure, um, look for what you can do. And where did this ceremony take place? Down the, um, in the front lake? of, um, we have one building that's our special event building, and we had just come from an out-of-town workshop on a school bus. So they all unloaded off the bus. We made our huge circle and um, handed out the manifesto. That's cool. Because yeah. at, at Liberty Lake, we've done a, a similar kind of thing, um, and we did it at the end of our last orientation, and we purposely ended it at nighttime so that we could make a campfire. And do it great. around a campfire, which was, you know, my resident camp friends know fire makes it more effective. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. It's, it's such a, such a great idea to, and to bring the, uh, the campfire into it. Even, even at day camp, you don't have to have it dark. You don't have to have a dark, uh, you know, nighttime training to have a campfire and, you know, have that, uh, No, that shout camp. out to my Everwood day camp friends who did a session at Tri-State and built a whole campfire indoors it was really cool yeah and that's what i was going to say as well you can do that you can even do it indoors if you don't have the outdoor space um we were, we were actually around the gaga pit <laughs> <laughs> had to make amazing. the circle around how day camp pit. can you be yeah. Sorry. <laughs> amazing um so for me i mean very very simple very basic thing but um we just have made a conscious effort and i think you know andy mentioned earlier about doing uh you know pre-camp kind of in the in the style of um a camp a camp conference where you know there's different breakout sessions and things that uh you know staff can choose from uh we don't necessarily give them the choice to go to um you know different sessions that that are offered we pretty much make everything mandatory or applicable to certain groups of people, but just keeping it fast paced and uh, making a lot of, you know, ensuring there's a lot of variety, um, different, different speakers, different people leading the sessions, um, having the, uh, you know, the, the, the style of, of uh, the delivery of those sessions be different. You know, if, if you're going to have to show videos in one, you know, the next one, having it outside in a circle and making, you know, uh, it interactive, um, just, you know, keeping it, uh, keeping it uh, very, very short and very uh, uh, ever, you know, ever changing, ever evolving so that, uh, you know, you can keep the attention spans of these, uh, of the Instagram generation of, of, of people. So that's, that's, what, that's what we've tried to do. Yeah, at, at my camp when we did it, um, the mandate was you have a half hour block, it should be a 20 minute session, right? And just try to keep it to that. And, and yeah, just keep people's attention and keep it moving. Great advice. All right, Camp Code, one of you guys, who's the first sacrificial lamb? I, I can go. Right. Um, so uh, to tag onto that, I'll send Matt uh, the uh, resource that I just did with the training that um, I put together with John Beitner, which is a list of interactive ways to teach. And it's a bunch of little ways. We actually taught it interactively. We cut them up and had people find their partner and discuss the topic and how you would use it and whatever. But it's kind of a nice little list of just ways to deliver information that's not just sit and get. So um, I'll send that along as, as a, a resource y'all can grab off the show notes on this. But for me, uh, my tip of the week is to address the, but we don't have enough time. You're never going to have enough time, sweetheart. Never. You're never going to have enough time in your staff training. Your first week of camp is staff training. Your second week of camp is still staff training. So I think about setting objectives for staff training. No more than three. And these are the three things that your staff should be able to do, say, understand, demonstrate by the time training ends. So I think about a team of remote staff that I manage that 
you know, we really only had the occasional training day. We might have one or two days before our outdoor ed season got started. And then I really didn't see folks. We communicated via email and that was about it. So in our days together, my number one objective was that they would be effective teachers. They would be effective teachers. Number two, we had extraordinary experience on that team. So learning from each other was really critical in our time together. And that third, that they would make mission focused decisions while they were working for us. And so if I had a, something I wanted to do on one of those training days, if it didn't fall directly into one of those objectives, we didn't do it. And I would send a video, I'd send a handout, I'd do it some other way, but it didn't happen on those training days. So what are your objectives for staff training? And that's gonna help you filter out the, the must do's and the I really wanna do's. And the I think this is important. If it doesn't check one of those boxes, it can wait. Awesome, great resource. Thanks so much for sharing that. All right, Gabby, bring us home. All right, so, um, so many to choose from, but I'd like to go back to what we were talking about, um, keeping it short and sweet and simple and involving other people to lead stuff. I know that for myself, when I think about other people leading stuff, I get a little bit anxious because um, they're not gonna do it the way I want them to do it. And that makes me nervous because then I think about my campers and I think about the first day and if they don't know how to do this, I'm stressed out. So for all of you that at home that are listening to this and saying, yes, 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 that's beautiful <laughs> to say, let's include all of our returning staff, but some of them aren't great at it. True, but we can, um, you know, maybe we can actually, there's, there's a beautiful solution for this. So for me, uh, a session format can look at like something like this, lecture, do, lecture, do, review. So you do lecturing for, let's just say 15 minutes, then you do maybe group discussion for five minutes, then you lecture for another 10 minutes, and then you do maybe a role play, and then you review. And in that, you can break down who can lead what in those sections. So if you, as a director, you're talking about maybe campers that are um, you know, missing home, that, that difficult period when parents drop off their kids and they leave and they're having a hard time and you're talking about that. Maybe there's pertinent information that you wanna say. So you do that lecturing for 15 minutes, you set it up, but then you have some of your re returning staff lead the do section, then you can also lecture then returning staff lead the do section, and then maybe returning staff bring them home and do the review. So lecture, do, lecture, do, review. And then hopefully you're not speaking for more than 15 minutes at a time, because we know that just, that's optimal you just, listening time. That's awesome. Can you just clarify the do part again? So Do means everybody's doing something. So either it's a group discussion or it's journaling or it's role playing or it's creating scenarios gotcha. but there is a no, there's a you're putting the information into action cool. um and that is a really important part when it comes to learning okay. and for me uh, a lot of the time staff training is modeled after schools and schools be, have the simple simple ratio that we have at schools is that it has to be a lot of lecturing and um, they have not a lot of opportunity to do. But at camp, that's not the reality. We can actually put into practice right away what we're learning. And that's the best way to actually learn. Camps are set up for optimal learning. It's just that we sometimes model ourselves after school, um, after the school um, uh, model. Right, and isn't so it funny get them that to do more stuff. we're so good at teaching kids, right? And then we go to teach staff and we start reverting back to this like 19th century school model, right? You know, exactly. and, uh, yeah. <clears throat> you know, to quote my friend Dave Malter again, you know, we want, we want orientation should be like camp, plain and simple, right? As much as it can be, right? And, and what you explained about, you know, about how to facilitate there, that which, which is great. It's very much how a lot of camps teach their like teens, right? They're, they're older campers, right? That's a very normal thing. Um, and it makes so much sense. It's so much common sense. We have to sort of break the mold. And, uh, and think that way with our staff too. And not try to take it on as every single session. Choose, as, choose your four or five sessions that you're going to practice this model in um, because it's gonna take some time to build it into, even yourself as a camp director, if you're used to lecturing between 30 to 45 minutes at a time, pairing your, your talk down to, to 15 minutes is very difficult because you have to um, filter out a lot of the 
uh, BS that you've put in over the years. So you've got to make sure that it's, it's really clear and to the point that is way harder to do than, um, uh, yeah, that's way harder to do than speaking for an hour. Hour speaking is easier. 15 minutes is hard. <laughs> so true. So true. Well, thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Ruby. I am so honored that you guys came on here and, uh, and, and shared your ideas with us. Um, it's really, really great. And it's great to see you guys on this podcast. Um, and I hope that we have many day camp potters that go over to uh, Camp Code and vice versa, um, because there's lots to learn, right? We're lifetime yeah. learners. That's why we, you just spent an hour listening to us, all right? For Obviously, sure. you care a lot. Um, and, you know, major shout out to uh, Travis and Beth Allison. Um, they, they must be very proud listening to this today. That's all I got to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the Go Camp Pro folks and Matt Hansberger, our, our dedicated producer, and our sponsors, ACA New York, New Jersey, Commercial Recreation Specialist, and AM Skyer for bringing this podcast to you. And if you don't want to miss an episode of Day Camp Pod, you should subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google. Give us a nice rating while you're at it. And check out the show notes for this and other episodes at daycamppodcast.com. And feel free to send us feedback and new ideas for future pods at our email address, daycampquestions at gocamp.pro. Thank you for listening and making yourself a better day camp professional. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode of the Day Camp Pod.